good. Now, last week we spent some time talking on this subject, and I need to review to kind of bring you up to speed, then we're going to get to where we need to go. We spoke about, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God favors you. No, say it like you really mean it. Say, neighbor, God favors you. We looked at the story of, of Mary and how that angel came to her and said to her, Mary, you are highly favored by God. And we shared four simple truths about that that I want to walk you through just by way of review. And then we're going to land on Joseph's perspective to talk about that. The first things I wanted us to all take away from the text this, uh, last week is that it's important that you know that you are highly favored by God. That was very, very important. And what we spoke in just as we talked about the fact that you're highly favored in the eyes of God, in the passive sense, it was important for you to hear the fact that you didn't choose God, God chose you. Oh, come on, somebody say amen. That was good news, that we did not choose God, God chose us. Very, very important that we not miss that, because favor as it relates to what God called us to do was not accidental, but it was an intentional purpose of God to have us here and to, to release us into the earth realm to do what he wants done. The second thing we, we saw about the concept of favor grammatically was the truth that in the perfect tense, favor was not something that comes and goes, right? Now, the reason that's important, because here's what we said to you last week. Depending on the mood, depending on what just transpired in my life, if you ask me how I'm doing, I will say blessed and highly favored. But if I'm going through a low and a down time in life, it's very unlikely that I will say that to you. Come on, are you with me? And I want you to know that favor is not seasonal. And because we, 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 we see favor as fe seasonal is because we don't understand what, fav what the favor of God really means. The favor of God speaks to the fact that God created you and preordained you with destiny and intention in mind. When that angel came to Mary and said, Mary, you are highly favored, what he was communicating to Mary was the fact that your season is now, and before the foundations of the world, God had predestined you to give birth to this chi Christ child. So that's not a, a come and go thing. It's what God was doing in her life. The second thing, as we kind of look at, uh, uh, to the text, as we said this, never allow, never allow circumstance to dictate the reality of God's favor on your life. Let me tell you why that is important. I'm, I'm moving through this quickly. is because if things aren't going the way I think they ought to go, sometimes I fool myself into thinking that God has gotten me. Oh, come on, somebody say amen this morning. I fool myself into thinking that maybe God doesn't have a plan. Maybe I'm not in his will. Maybe I'm missing something. So I wanted to encourage you last week to say, don't allow your circumstance to dictate the reality of God's favor on your life. That was very, very important. And then the third thing, this is very, very important. The power needed to implement the favor of God in your life, it doesn't come from you. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Here's what Mary said. Just for those of you that missed the message, I'm going to encourage you to go to, to iTunes, get the podcast, go to YouTube, do whatever you need to do. Here's what Mary said. Hey, God, uh, when the angel spoke to her, you are highly favored. God's going to give birth to a child. She said, I'm a virgin. And what that word virgin meant was the, the Greek word aner, which speaks to man, saying, angel, I don't have a husband, so how is God going to do what God wants done through me? What she was really saying to the angel, I don't have the wherewithal. I don't have the resources. I don't have the vehicle for this child to be born. And here's what the angel said to her. If, if God needed you to have, I wish I had somebody, a vehicle. Come on, are you hearing with me? And here's what he said. God himself is going to be the vehicle through which this Christ child is going to come. So the Holy Spirit, he says, will overshadow you. I wish I had somebody in here. Because the reason a lot of us have not realized our destiny yet is because we're looking at our bank accounts. Ah, oh, y'all not hearing me. We're looking at our circumstance. And God is saying, when purpose begins, provision is already provided. In other words, I won't ask you to do something I don't have the ability to provide the resources for you to do what I need done. That's what he's saying. So don't, 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 you need to know it doesn't come from you, it comes from God. And finally, and we're going to pick up here, is that understand with me, God doesn't show us favor so we can be eternally pregnant. At some point, the birth must occur. 
Here's what that means. God didn't deposit gifts and callings and visions and insights for you for us to walk around. Girl, I got this thing in me. Dude, it's wrapped up in me. And 40 years later, here you are, this thing is in me. Come on. And 90 years later, here you are, this thing is in me. At some point, his expectation, come on, are you with me? Is that we give birth to what God has called us to do. So I want to shift today. I want us to look at, we, we, we studied Mary last week. I want to look at Joseph a little bit this week, and I want to kind of pick up and talk through that a little bit. But let me just begin with just a brief testimony, then we're going to move to this. About approximately, I think it was a little over 10 years ago, during this week, at this time frame, in December of 2008, I found myself in a medically induced coma. And I was in that coma for 18 days, and it was a result of colon cancer. The reason I'm telling you that is because in that coma, coma, God, you know, you, you, you're like, when you, I don't know if you, well, I can't say if you've ever been in a coma. <laughs> but, but it's like you're awake, but you're not awake. You kind of get what I'm saying? It's like you're living, but you're not living. You kind of get. So God had me in this state. And I kid you not, I shared this with you all several years ago. In that state, God reminded me of ministry call. God reminded me of purpose. God reminded me of destiny. He reminded me of who I am. And I kid you not, the Lord showed me vividly why he created me, what I was supposed to be doing. He showed me people. He showed me location. He showed me places. He showed me everything he destined and called me to do because I was still for 18 days. But you know how life happens. You get out of that coma, life, and life progress, progresses because things don't happen in the timing that you want it to happen, sometimes we get discouraged. Come on, come on, are you with me? Sometimes we quit, sometimes we give up, and we forget the purposes of God. And I want to say some of you in here have been the same way. You've heard the voice of God. God has spoken to you. Come on, y'all, you've heard from him. But because it doesn't look the way God said it ought to look, and because it didn't happen in the timing of God, you got to the place where you wanted to abort, and as opposed to giving birth to the child, you end up wanting to abort the process, and you contemplate that. But this morning, I need your attention just for a few moments to share some critical truth with you. And I want you to lock into this. Whenever you are in danger of aborting your preordained purpose in life, God always, come on, say he always. always. He always sends a messenger to remind you of who you are and encourage you to press on to complete the journey. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, press, press on. So here's what we can talk about today. I want us to wake up and obey God as we look at this. So go with me to the book of Matthew. Let me read this text, and then we're going to share just three simple truths from it to allow God to speak and be God in our midst. Look at verse 18. It says, now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. I mean, the ESV. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, and before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin will conceive and will bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph, Joseph woke, from his sleep, woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called her name Jesus. He called his name, amen, Jesus. Four simple things I want to share with you. Look at verse 1 again. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together. Come on, say before they came together. Before they came together, the text says Mary had been betrothed, and before they came together, she was found to be with child and from the Holy Spirit. 
And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Here's the first thing I want you to take to lock, to, to lock in as we kind of walk into this. Life has a way, do I have any witness here, of tempting you to abort God's plan for your life. <laughs> now, I know we got a bunch of church folk and a bunch of that ain't been through nothing. <laughs> but if you've ever been through, come on, y'all. If you've ever encountered challenges and, challenge and difficulties in life, life has a way of tempting us to say enough is enough. Matter of fact, let me simplify this even more. All you've got to do is go to church and encounter church folk. Maybe I ought to restate that point. Church people have a way of tempting you. Amen. Are you with me? To abort God's plan for your life. And, and, and this, look at the text, right? The text says here, we, we saw Mary, and you've got to really get into what we're saying about last week, Mary, to kind of lock into this. It says, this is how Jesus' birth came, came, came about, right? Here's Mary's scenario. Mary, the, the text says, is betrothed to Joseph. And here's what that betrothal process means that we spoke about last week. It was pretty, it was an intense, uh, a next level engagement process. And what that meant is that Joseph's family and Mary's family had already got together and the wager has been paid, had been paid, and, and it was almost as if the, the prenup or the contracts had already been signed. And here's how I said it last week. This thing was going down. Yeah. It was going to happen. The only way out of this betrothal process was a divorce needed to take place. But here's what happens during the betrothal process. There is a year waiting period where Joseph goes to his home and Mary goes to, to her home and the two don't come together for an entire year until the formal marital process take place. They were engaged, they were betrothed, and this thing was about to take place. She had the word from the Lord. The angel had just showed up to her and say, this is what I'm going to do. Now the angel is about to come to Joseph and release what he's going to do. Now notice what the text says. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. This is a problem in the text for me because she's engaged and there's this year waiting period, and Joseph is waiting for this year to transpire, and sometime between the engagement and the actual marriage, Mary says, Joseph, we got a problem. <laughs> and, and that word came together has some sexual nuances. That's the the way they would speak that in that language, they came together. So here's what it says. She was pregnant. Now, fellas, fellas, be honest with me. Be honest with me. Ladies, I'm not talking to you right now. You're engaged. And she shows up and says, hey, boo, <laughs> something happened. And fellas, you know you hadn't done anything. Come on, talk to me. Yeah, y'all already going like that. I'm peace out, right? Peace out. Imagine the explanation and the, the explaining that Mary had to do to this fiance of hers to say to her, I'm pregnant. And she probably said, and it ain't yours, but I have not cheated on you. Watch the text. Verse 19. Her husband being a just man, okay? This is speaking to Joseph's character, to Joseph's righteousness, to Joseph's commitment to the things of the law. And watch this. And unwilling to put her to shame, he resolved to divorce her quietly. Let me, let me, let me, let me tell you all what that's saying in current day terms. Joseph said, you're yeah, right. <laughs> You're yeah, right, okay? I'm out. I'm unplugging. And the beauty of what I love about Joseph's character, because Matthew's trying to show us how righteous these two individuals was, he did not, you know, this is what most of us would do. With, with the advent of Facebook, I ain't naming no name. <laughs> but what had happened was, right? 
and were putting people on blast. But notice the character of this man. He had already resolved in his mind and committed himself. Listen to this. Because of the circumstance that I find myself in, I am going to abort this word that God has released. I'm going to abort this thing that God's going to do. I am going to unplug. I'm not going to do it anymore. And he had legal right because the laws in Deuteronomy gave him an out. It talks about this in Deuteronomy chapter 22, specifically about 23 and 24, that if a virgin finds herself pregnant during the betrothal process, it talks about everything that's going to happen. He had every right to quit. Now, the reason I'm pointing that out, some of you in here have been in situation, you have heard the word of the Lord, you've heard the voice of God, and then life happens. Come on, circumstances. I know I'm not talking to myself. Come on. The job you had just went away from you. The relationship, the situation, the circumstance, the economy, everything turned upside down, and you have every legal right to quit and to give up. Does anybody in here know that God, when God releases a word over your life, there is nothing we can do to impede what God wants done. Y'all not hear me. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't give up. Come on, tell them. Say, don't give up. Every right, every right, every right. And the interesting thing is that sometimes, here's what life looks like. I said this earlier. The church can be discouraging. The world can be discouraging. Friends can be discouraging. You ever had a dream? You ever had a vision? You ever had a passion? You ever had something in you, and you release that thing to a friend, and they looked at you like, sure. Yeah, right. And when we give up prematurely, as opposed to pressing through. Joseph had every right given the circumstances. And not only did he have every right, he went to bed that night with intentions of waking up the next morning and going through the legal proceedings to give Mary her writ of divorce. That's what he was going to do. Right? That's what he was going to do. But y'all say this to me. Come on, say, but God. Say it again, say, but God. But God. Let, let, me, let me tell you why, why I like that, but God, that's so interesting. Because look at this, God's going to intervene. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. God will intervene, and, and, and when God intervenes, God doesn't intervene for, for your sake. I wish I had somebody in here. He, he doesn't intervene because you're that good and because you're that righteous and because you're that holy. He doesn't intervene for that. He intervenes to protect his word. Over, you got to get this over your life. And let me tell you why he intervenes to protect his word, because Isaiah puts it this way. As the rain falls and, and it doesn't return, turns into dew before it works, first waters the earth. Here's what he says. So is my word. It does not return to me void unless it accomplished that which I sent it to do. So here's what this means. There is nothing you can go through in life to prevent God's word from being realized in your life. I wish I had somebody in here. You found yourself on the run, and you thought the car accident was just an accident, but it could have been God that intervened because he's going to protect his word. You've got to hear me this morning. He's going to protect his word because God is not a man that he should lie, nor is he the son of man that he should do what? Change his mind. If God has deposited destiny in you, Y'all don't believe me, check in with Jonah. You can run. Thank you. And if you understand anything about the providential intervention of God, every circumstance, every predicament, every situation, every crisis that you and I have encountered in life was all the providence of God directing our path so we could end up doing what he created us to do. And the reason that is critical and that is paramount is because before you showed up, God had already preordained what you're supposed to do on the earth realm and no pregnancy, no life crisis, nothing can prevent God's word from being realize he's going to intervene he's going to intervene let's look at this look at the text look at the text look at what it says verse 20 but as he considered these things an angel of the lord appeared to him where 
in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of who? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Joseph, son of who? I said one more time. Joseph, son of who? You see, my problem and your problem is we don't know whose child we are. And so when God shows up, he has to attach you to the prophecy of your destiny. He has, come on, come on now. He has to attach you to the lineage that he began before the foundation. Of, I wish I had somebody of the earth. He, he didn't just say, hey, Joseph, the carpenter, because Joseph could have said to him, carpentry wasn't making me no money, so I quit. Come on, y'all not hearing me. He could have said, business is slow, so I closed it down. But he says, Joseph, it's not about your current job or your current circumstance. I want to connect you with destiny. I want to connect you with what I ordained before the foundation of the world. I want to connect you to your through true identity. When I think I'm Gilbert's boy, I want to give up. But when I remember I'm God's child. <laughs> when I remember, when I remember I'm an image bearer. When I remember the thing that's deposited within me didn't come from man. Come on. It didn't come from my mom. I know that it come from God. Before the foundations of the world, God ordained me to be what I am today. When I remind myself of that, it doesn't matter the circumstance. I, God has a way of waking me up to say, are you hearing me? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, the problem is you need to know who you are. Yeah, come on. Turn to your other neighbor and say, neighbor. Child of God. Yeah, come on, tell them, say child of God. Yeah, one more time, say child of God. And hear me, church, it doesn't matter what it looks like right now. It doesn't matter what the circumstances right now. It doesn't matter what the predicament is right now. If God has released a word over your life, that word will not return to God and say, hey, God, they quit. God's not going to go back in his private changers and recall Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and say, we missed one. <laughs> he's sovereign. He's omnipotent. He will redirect the world to accomplish his purposes. Let me show this. And I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Let me show this. It says, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take Mary for your wife, for that which is conceived in her. I love this genesis of source. It's from the Holy Spirit. Come on, say, from the Holy Spirit. One more time, say, from the Holy Spirit. Do me a favor. Y'all touch your chest real quick. And say, that, that said, self, the thing that's in me didn't come from me. It came from the Holy Spirit. One more time, say, self, the thing that's in me didn't come from me, it came from the Holy Spirit. That's a very, very important, that's a very, very important principle that I want you all to get real quick. Because here, here, here's what Joseph was saying. Mary found herself pregnant, and Mary is saying to Joseph, hey, I have this child. And Joseph, humanistically speaking, is saying, yeah, right, sure. But the angel showed up and said to her that the thing that's in her is not from man, it's from the Holy Spirit. And you need to understand that because sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking. I said this last week, we've had these visions and dreams since childhood. God has been showing us who we need to be, and sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that we've missed God. But if God has deposited something there, and look at this, I'm almost there. She shall bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. And look at the reason. He will do what? Save people from what? Church, thing in you, I said this last week, and I don't have time to deal with this, but let me just say it again. It's not about you. <sighs> it's not about you. It's about what God wants done in the earth realm, that God wants to use you as the vehicle to draw people to a relationship with him. Come on, are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? <laughs> the thing that God has...
deposit in that gift, that calling. And here's the mistake we make in church, right? Is we restrict gift and callings to the inside perimeters of the church. And here's what we said. I can't sing, so I can't join the worship team or the choir. I can't preach, so I can't be a preacher. I can't serve like that, so I can't be a deacon. I can't, come on, y'all get where I'm going? And because all we know is church, we think gift and callings are restricted to the inside perimeters of the church. God's mission in life is not to save the church, but to save the world. Come on, I wish I had somebody in here. You got to, here's what he said in the New Testament. I didn't come for the well, but for the sick and to bring the righteous to repentance. So here's what, he's going to deposit engineering passions and business passions and financial passions, come on, and social passions. He will put that stuff in you, lock into this, and position you in the world so you can give birth to children. His goal, his job, his objective is to reach the world. So marketplace, where, where, don't fool yourself into thinking it's only in here. That's the mistake we make. And so that's why we run. God's calling me. And we think calling means full-time ministry in church. We don't see calling as ministry to the world. Here's how I said it last week. Mary has yet to preach a message, but she was called. <laughs> After Jesus was born, and I think it's that temple encounter, we don't hear much about Joseph, but he was called. He was so called that God himself released Gabriel to remind him of his call. You and I are here today because of their obedience and commitment to the things of God. Somebody out there is waiting for you to obey. Oh. Oh. Come on. Somebody out there is waiting for you to obey. So here, here, here's the final thing I want to share with you all, then, then I'm done. We're going to pick this up next week from a different place. So lock into this. Considering the test, considering God's intervention, if I'm you, here's what I'm doing. I'm waking up, and I'm doing what? So here's me. I found myself in that coma for 18 days. God woke me up. You might say, Felix, why do you have such a renewed passion? Why do you have such a vigor? Why do you have such a drive? Why are you so crazy? Why do you take such big risk? I know what God said. Metaphorically speaking, I know what that angel said to me in a dream. More importantly, I know who I am. I know why God created me. So my job is to wake up and obey him and listen to this, and don't walk around eternally pregnant, allowing circumstance to dictate the deliverable. Oh, y'all not hear me. <sighs> I said this to our team this morning. The harvest is what? Ripe. But the laborers are what? The problem with the laborers is that they're still pregnant. And we're contemplating abortion because of the circumstance and we're not getting involved we're allowing wounds we're allowing life we're allowing circumstances and we're like joseph in this indecisive place and today prophetically speaking god has sent his angel to say to you wake up and obey god wake up and obey god come on bow your heads with me Lord, you're a wonderful God. You're an awesome God, Lord. We give ourselves to you today, God. This Christmas season, as we saw Mary obeying you and giving birth to this Christ child, and we saw Joseph in a dilemma, in a crisis, Lord, where he wanted to give up, yet still he obeyed you. Open our hearts, God, to receive. Speak to us, God, as we go into this season of Advent, Lord, to hear from you. 
all glory, all praise, all honor belongs to you. And Lord, should there be one today that don't know you as Lord and Savior, I am praying, God, that you would speak, that you would move, that you would have your way, that you would be God in our midst. Oh, how we love you. Oh, how we adore you. Oh, how we give you place. Praise God. So thank you for being God, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for who you are. Let us search our hearts. Let us search our inner being, God, and respond to you. Oh, how we love you. Oh, how we bless you. 